Thorns is doing everyone's job. <laughs> okay. Um, Bori Duff. My my name is Councillor Cheryl Carlisle, and Councillor Paul. Councillor Paul, the meeting started. Thank you. Um, start again. Yeah, Borida. My name is Councillor Cheryl Carlisle, and I'm the chair of the Finance and Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Can I welcome everyone to the meeting, which is a multi-location meeting? The meeting will be live streamed and recorded, and will be available for viewing after the meeting. Should the live streaming fail, the meeting will continue, and a recording will be available through the council's website following the conclusion of the meeting. Can I remind members that translation facilities are available and for those attending remotely to choose your language of choice. For those wishing to speak in the chamber, please raise your hand. For those attending remotely, please use the raised hand function. We will alternate between speakers in the chamber and remote attendees. For those attending remotely, please note those in the chamber will be unable to use the chat facility, so please bring any comments to our attention. Committee members who are attending remotely are required to leave their camera on throughout the debate and when voting in order to maintain the integrity of the decision making process. If you do need to leave the meeting temporarily, pop a message in the chat function so the Democratic Services Officer is aware and let us know when you return. Can I stress that I expect everyone present and participating in this meeting to conduct themselves appropriately and be respectful to each other. That applies to members, officers and anyone in the public gallery. When I open up the debate to members, I will ask the committee members to speak and put their questions first, followed by non-committee members. It would be helpful if members could ask all their questions in one go. Whilst I do not wish to stifle debate, can I remind members that any questions should be focused on the subject matter and to avoid repetition. If I feel the length of individual speeches are negatively impacting on the overall time for discussion and becoming unmanageable, I will defer to the committee's rules of procedure, which limits the length of speeches to five minutes. Oh, I have missed that. Right, um, before we move on to the agenda, just a couple of comments and um, welcome back after the um, enforced break we've had. Um, I'd like to extend our congratulations to our new members of parliament, MPs Hughes and German, um, not you, Councillor Chris, but never mind. Um, I'd also like to pay tribute to our retired Cluid West MP, David Jones, for the 19 years of service he's given to the people of Cluid West and Conway. So, um, we, before we start, okay, I'd like to move on to item one, appointment of vice chair. Could I have a proposer, please? Councillor Stephen. working out. Councillor Penny's working next. Right, to you. There we go. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Um, I'd like to propose Dilwyn. Councillor uh, Dilwyn. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Stephen. Could I have a seconder, please? Councillor Frank. Thank you. Have we got any more nominations? No. Well, if everyone would like to show, please, in favour of Councillor Dilwyn. Think anybody against? No, that's that's unanimous. Congratulations, Councillor Dilwyn. If you'd like to uh, come up to the second hot seat, that would be brilliant. And while Councillor Dilwyn's doing that, we'll move on to uh, item two: apologies for absence. Sally, uh, yeah, apologies from Councillors John Roberts and Gareth Jones. Anybody else? Nope. Okay, thank you, Sally. Item three, declarations of interest. Has anyone any declarations of interest before we start? Nope. Item four, urgent matters. Not aware of any. Um, we'll move on to item five, the minutes of the meeting of, oh, 13th of May. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Um, I think on page... Page seven uh, around the question. I've now received a reply from Councillor Charlie about the repairs and maintenance for schools. Um, I think there's some six million plus um, repairs and maintenance outstanding. So I'm sure that's going to be discussed further at, at uh, other meetings. So thank you for that. Any other points on the minutes, members? 
No. Can I have a proposal and seconder, please? <laughs> Councillor Paul and Councillor Frank were first. If everyone would like to show. Lovely. Thank you. That's carried. Uh, now, minutes of the informal meeting of Ophium Scrutiny Committee Chairs and Vice Chair, pages 12 to 16. Could I have a proposed and second that we accept those minutes, please? Councillor Paul? Any takers? Councillor Stephen? Oh, Councillor Anne. Excellent. Thank you. If everyone would like to show. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, we're zipping through this, aren't we? Item seven, minutes of the Conway Opportunities Board. Have we got pages 17 to 18? Have we got a proposer and a seconder, please? Anybody? Any takers? Councillor Paul, thank you very much. Any seconders? No, oh, someone online. Oh, Councillor Nia, thank you, <laughs> deal. And if everyone would like to show, thank you. And we move on to, oh, and, and the second, the second lot, pages 19 and 20, um, of the 25th of the 624, same again, proposed and seconded, please. Councillor Paul, thank you. And Councillor Anne, lovely. Thank you, if everyone would like to show. Thank you. We now move on to item eight to review the forward work programme and Dawn, who is busy multitasking this morning, has popped back in. Thank you, Dawn. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. So morning, members. So following the pre-election period, reports have now been rescheduled accordingly and they are included in the forward plan within your agenda packs on pages 21 to 32. Uh, can I remind members that we do have a special meeting next Thursday, um, Thursday, Thursday the 25th of July at four o'clock, and that is to consider the office accommodation strategy. So that's my update, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Lovely. Thank you, Dawn. Any questions on that, members? No? Oh, Councillor Anne. Councillor Anne's live. Yeah, just a quickie, uh, Chair. Um, I see that Mochdra Commerce Park has been removed from the uh, Scrutiny Forward Work Plan, and I'm not sure if that's a mistake or it's a, d a dedicated action, but I don't think it should be removed from our plan. Thank you, Councillor Anne. Dawn, please have Thanks, Councillor Ron. I'll have further discussions with uh, the Chief Exec and the Head of Law and Governance and find out when that's going to come forward. Thank you, Dawn. Yeah, thanks, Dawn. Satisfied, Councillor Anne. We'll, we'll update all the members of this, this committee. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other? No? Are we all happy with the forward plan? If you could all show, please. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Now, and thank you, Dawn, and welcome back from your holiday, which must seem like a dim and distant memory. We now move on to item nine. Question to the leader from Councillor David Carr. Councillor um, David, um, there's no more than 10 minutes that can be Cheryl, spent on... Oh. There are a second part to the forward work plan. There's a combined work programme, or have I missed something? Say that again, Councillor. Is there a combined work, but a forward work programme? Yes, yeah. The combined... Oh, that's what we were discussing. We were discussing it all. Okay, so I do have a question then. Oh, right, lovely. Okay. Um, if I've got the right pack. <laughs> it's on page 53, which is the Employment Monitoring Report 2023-24. And what's your question, please? Okay. Um, my question is, will this include um, agency staff and those who are, are potentially on secondment from either inside or outside of the county, and what costs are incurred in relation to potentially agency staff and procured staff? Can I suggest I'll take that up with the officers and the cabinet member and get back to you? Thank, thank you, Dawn. You can tent with that, Councillor Stephen? Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, 
well, we've already we've already agreed. Um, we have already uh, agreed the forward work program the combined one. So thank you. So going back to item nine, question to the leader from Councillor David. No more than ten minutes spent on this question. Councillor David is going to ask. Um, is going to ask the question. Councillor Charlie is going to answer. And there is one supplementary question. Um, and the supplementary question must be something that has arisen directly out of the original question or the reply. Okay, <laughs> Councillor David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the question to the Leader of the Council. The rec reckless cuts in vital public services provided by the Council's ERF department, treatment of weeds, street cleaning, reduced removal of litter bins, has resulted in numerous complaints from residents in Colwyn Ward and throughout the county. I met with officers from the ERF on Monday the 1st of July to discuss how to put things right. The officers have been told that their hands are tied. They do not have the authority to spend the money to provide the services expected by residents. It's irrefutable that this is a problem we did not have in previous years. Vital public services we provide need to be a priority. Will the cabinet think again and put the money back into the vital services, treatment of weeds, street clean, and provision of litter bins to meet the needs of our residents? Thank you, Councillor David. Councillor Charlie. Um, Del Cadera, the Borough Dia Pub, and thank you for the question, David. Um, I'd like to start by pointing out that it's not cabinet that sets the budget, it's the full council, with every one of the 55 members having an equal vote. And I think it's important to give some context to the difficult decision that we had to make last year. So in a normal year, we would get around 72% of our funding from central government. The amount we actually received last year was 2.29%, um, which was the joint lowest in Wales alongside Gwyneth. That equated to £4.6 million. So to give that some context, the pay and pensions for our teachers and our own staff was in the region of £14.8 million. So we didn't even receive a third of the amount we need actually just to pay our staff. And obviously it's worth noting that um, pay scales are set at a national level by Welsh Government for Teachers and at a UK level for our own staff. Um, a 1% rise in council tax uh, uh, rises around £750,000, give or take. So even with another really painful and eye-watering council tax rise, essentially at 10%, that um, gives around seven, seven £78 million, pounds. you're still actually short of the wage bill, uh, even with that really, really difficult decision. So the pressures we faced were in the region of £26 million. Pounds. Um, we have service pressures with our children looked after. We have a huge increase in homelessness that we've got a statutory duty to look after. We had to pay our care staff the real living wage. We had to increase our care fees to ensure that there's somewhere suitable and appropriate for our retired residents to go to. A uh, huge amount of work went into that, but we were still faced with having to make £12 million pounds of cuts to our services. Now, that's incredibly daunting in any year. But on the back of sort of an excess of £80 million pounds cuts over the last sort of 10 years, that just gets more and more challenging, and that's directly due to policy of austerity. So in order to meet that challenge, I wanted to ensure that members were fully informed. So we had six budget workshops over the year covering all the services, so that was a really good opportunity for members to have a, a two-way discussion about their pressures, about where they could make savings and to make proposals about savings that they could make. Um, if I'm honest, it was disappointing in the attendance. Uh, unfortunately, you, you weren't able to attend two of those meetings. So it's difficult to get a rounded picture of the whole budget. You know, I appreciate members have other priorities, but that was a really good opportunity for people to um, discuss these. So then as part of the democratic process, all proposed service cuts were brought to this committee on the 22nd of January. Now, within that pack, there is a literally a line by line of every single proposals that we're, we're proposing to make. I would point out that that's, um, I look at a lot of other councils' budgets, as you can imagine, there's far more information in there for members to make their decisions than any other council. Um, those proposals were passed by that committee. It then returned to Cabinet on the 29th of February. Members will be aware that I'm always open to non-members of the Cabinets to ask questions. So again, there was an opportunity there. And then finally, it came to full council on the 29th. It was in that pack again. Um, that was a difficult meeting. You know, these are difficult times. But the, you know, the, the feeling I got, the main concern people had about not supporting that budget was with the rate of council tax, which, again, I recognise was incredibly painful. For our residents, um, there was a lot less discussion about the cuts than there was about that level, and that is the difficult balance that we have to make. 
But returning to where we are now, you know, no one wants to see weeds in our streets. It's upsetting for residents, it's off-putting for tourists. I get the same complaints that you get. Um, spraying has now commenced. Um, progress has been a little bit delayed by the unseasonally warm weather, which has also uh, encouraged the growth to be more vigorous than it would be in normal weathers, but we should see a, a real improvement in that soon. And I would note that research shows that one application a year is sufficient um, to prevent any structural damage to our highways. Turning to bins under the Environmental Protection Act, the Council actually has no legal duty to provide litter and dog waste, but we do have a duty to keep our land and public highways clear of litter and refuse as far as is practicable. practicable. From Conway, we have 1,400 bins, which is substantially above similar local authorities. And even without the financial pressures we face, it's about having the right number of bins in the right places. Um, we are currently co conducting a review to make sure that's fit for purpose. Um, I would like to remind residents to take this opportunity that um, following a change in legislation a few years ago, that dog waste can be disposed of in any litter bin. So if the dog bin's thin, I'll, you know, I'll ask them to carry it to the next nearest bin. So turning towards next year, we'll clearly look at any lessons learned and try to find a solution, which will include working with our town and community councils. But I think it's timely to remind members that the financial outlook for the next two years is exceedingly worrying. Welsh Government remain adamant that there will be little or no increase in funding for councils over the next two years, leaving us with projected finance gaps of £18 million next year and £13 million the following year. So I'm firmly of the opinion that further cuts of this magnitude is unsustainable will do irreparable damage to already weakened services. At a time when personal taxation is, is, at, is at its highest since the Second World War, it should, this should not be happening, and both Welsh and UK government need to take this on board. The situation across the UK as a whole is critical. I firmly believe that we have prevented the bar of the NHS, and it's clear to me that a failure to adequately fund local services will inevitably lead to worse outcomes and higher costs for all. But once again, thank you for the question. You know, Councillor Charlie. Councillor David, you've got a supplementary question that you can ask. Thank you, Chair. I, I think on the weeds, you know, I would dispute that one treatment a year is sufficient. I, th I think, you know, the research I've looked at, I think you need the three treatments. And we're not talking about an awful lot of money. It's 25k for one treatment. For three treatments, it will be 75k. And the money this council spends, I mean, there was 60 thousand pounds spent on an agency to actually uh set, set resettle homeless people and that resettled one really you know and that's an example of, of wasting money then of course there's a rugby pitch six hundred and fifty thousand on a rugby pitch when we can't keep the streets clean uh 20 percent cuts in the rf for next year you know really for me right you know oh, I is this a, a question you frame this as a question to the leader yeah David, yeah, yeah, yeah i am yeah. i'm just saying 20 percent cuts in the rf next year are we going to have six weekly bin collections or two monthly bin collections? Because you can't cut any more. I had meetings with the RF officers and we had long discussions. You can't really cut and you've cut everything you can cut. You've cut the street clean. 32 people have lost their jobs. We normally employ 32 agency, agency can, workers. Can I raise a point of order? The, the councillor is making a statement rather than asking a question. Again, every time I speak, you know. He's going, can I've I be allowed to Cherry, to Cherry, if, I'm, Cherry if I may just come in. No, you it, can't come in. It, you always want to come in. Can I actually ask my question? And Cher, can Cherry, if I can after. come in. Cherry, can I actually speak? That can, we, can, we can we just can we can we just allow Councillor Carr to ask his supplementary question? And if Councillor Carr can be can, can be mindful that it is an opportunity for a supplementary question, not a statement that relates directly to the original question asked or to the answer that's been given, please. Otherwise, it's not permissible. Right. So, so good frame it as a question. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm asking about the twenty percent cut for next year that I've met with the RFA officers, we can't sustain any more cuts and I don't know how, how they're going to do it really. And I said the 32 agency workers that have lost the jobs, that public will start to notice that, won't they? That we're working on the roads and cleaning the streets and working in the parks. 32 people lost that we normally employ between April and October. That's going to have a big effect and that effect will be noticed by, by residents this year. So what, what, what the, the, the final question I'm asking is that, that we need to have a halt to these cuts and we need to look at other areas of the council for, for, to, to make the reductions. No more cuts in the IRF because really it's not viable. Councillor Charlie, if you So, Chair, that seemed more of an observation than a question. So, uh, 
Yeah, I also note, Chair, that we've run out of time for the 10 minutes. So I suppose so far as the, there is a question that um, the, the, that uh, the leader wishes to respond to, I, I would suggest that's provided in writing subsequently, Chair. Can I just so make the point of order in my own? Can, can I, I, I just I, make one point on, of order, please? David, I think that can the I make a point of order and was... say that the leader of the council spent too long answering the question, so there was no time for a supplementary, really. So, and then you say there's only 10 minutes. Most of the 10 minutes was taken up by the leader of the council, really, and out facts and figures, really, rather than answering the question directly. That, thank, that, you. Thank, thank you, Councillor David. Councillor Charlie, if you could answer that last part of the question about the effects of the cuts, I think, if I understood that outside of the meeting, if you could do that. Uh, always happy to answer a member's question, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor David, Councillor Charlie. Okay, we now move on to item 10A, the uh, new Welsh language promotion strategy, um, 24 to 2029, pages 71 to 95. It's going to be introduced by Councillor Aaron Wynne, and then uh, Nia is going to take us through the report. So, Councillor Aaron. Uh, there is. Thank um, you, Chair. Yeah. I'm just going to start by passing you on to Nia here. This is our uh, new uh, Welsh promotion strategy, Ein Llais Cymraeg, and it is aiming to uh, offer a framework for members and staff to create uh, a bilingual council here in Conway. The strategy does build on our good practice that we already have here and incorporates what we have learned from the uh, the uh, leading in a bilingual plan. I'd like to thank uh, Fran and Andy Wilkinson for their input. Uh, Welsh learners have uh, contributed to this to shape our new uh, direction for the future, and I'm very glad to be supporting it. I'd also like to thank Councillor Gwenel Ellis and Louise Embry for their work as well. The Welsh language does belong to all of us. It does not belong more to me as someone who does speak Welsh every day. It belongs to everyone equally, and we all have a duty to create a Conway where the Welsh language will develop for the future. And this is our strategy. I'd also like to thank Nia and Lynette here and the council staff who use and promote the Welsh language every day. Nia, over to you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me today to present the Welsh Promotion Strategy to you, which is Ein Llais Cymraeg. Having a Welsh Promotion Strategy is a legal requirement, but that's not why we're doing this. We're doing this because the Welsh language is part of who we are. It's our language and it belongs to all of us. The Welsh language voice can bring us all together and we would love everyone to join us, no matter how much Welsh you know, wherever you come from and wherever you live in the country. 25.9% of Conway's residents speak Welsh and 51% of our staff speak some Welsh. And we know many more on the Welsh language journey, from learning Borada and saying a few words to informal conversational Welsh through to fully con conversant. Our vision is a bilingual Conway where people are confident and proud of the Welsh voice and where Cymraeg is spoken in the family, the community and the workplace and where Welsh culture is celebrated and people feel they belong. We have three themes in the strategy, which are family, workplace and community. We have many uh, goals and uh, 
visions uh, behind this and these themes means that there are there's much work to be done now and to the future this all fits in with the vision for uh, Welsh language in 2050, which is to uh, reach a million Welsh speakers. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that um, report. Over to you, members. Questions, please. <coughs> Councillor Paul. I'm referring to paragraph 6.2, Aaron. Um, totally supportive of the strategy, uh, want it to work. Can I put the microphone close to you, please? Want Thank it you. to work and um, very happy with the proposals within it. Um, as somebody who attended the six budget working groups, I do remember some discussion within uh, one of those budget working groups about um, how we maximised the income to the council from the services our services provided to other bodies and whether we were as efficient and effective of maximising that income. And the reason I raise that is because within Paravar 6.2, it says it will be funded initially from reserves and eventually a business case will need to be presented for consideration. Now, I want to drill down on um, the specific detail of how it will be funded initially from reserves, because again, I don't remember, but this may be my fault, that being part of the discussion during the budget working groups. But I, I may be wrong, but I, I just want to know how much money is coming out of reserves uh, and how that, will, how that will happen. I don't know if Aaron can answer that. So we've had this funding for the um, the the um Welsh lessons for the past five years, we've been given a grant for that and we, we haven't paid a penny for it. So we always knew that this day would probably come where we needed to start funding it um, ourselves. Um, so initially for the first year, we are um, providing £10,000 towards the courses and the rest is still paid uh, through the grant. Um, and eventually it will be uh, uh, on a year by year basis um, that that progresses. So, so these this ten thousand pounds is in the reserves under your present budget. It's a sort of contingency within your present budget. Yes, because we did have a business case for this, but because we weren't using it, we gave it back. But we kept ten thousand pounds towards this because it was going to be something that was going to be on the cards eventually. We were just lucky that we had another two years from the initial uh, time when we thought we'd have to pay. Thank you for that. And, and the other bit of... Well, in, in one way, I actually need to explain it in the end, but ju just to just to uh, just to quickly confirm. So uh, effectively, yeah, within obviously law and governance's uh, service reserves, uh, that there, there was sufficient money. And I appreciate obviously there was a previous decision by uh, cabinet to um, to put a freeze on reserves. Mm -hmm. But in the context of the budget setting process, uh, it was agreed that that 10,000. And I guess it I guess it's uh, because because it's within my delegation as the section 151 officer for 10,000 pound i uh, i guess approve that through through the process so the the 10,000 pound is set aside and when when the outturn report comes comes now presenting the earmark reserves for consideration through scrutiny and then to cabinet um, you'll you'll see that item explicitly there uh, i guess moving forward in terms of any desire for 25 26 then then a new business case will need to come forward at that point for consideration okay could i then ask specifically in terms of maximizing income to your budget, in a sense, from these services we provide to other local authorities, other bodies, translation, et cetera. Are we now confident that um, 
if you like, the user charges, um, we are maximizing that and that um, there is some equity between what certain bodies and local authorities pay, pay to us, because obviously that would be a significant contribution to, to enable us not only to deliver this strategy, but our overall work in this area. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd, I'd, I'd just like to speak to that particular point um, that, that Councillor Paul's raised. It's, it's something that we're very aware of, um, that we, we, we've worked in year for the contracts that we have with other organisations to ensure um, that charges have been increased where we can negotiate those and where we haven't been able to do that. We, we've, we've looked at making efficiencies uh, for, for the fact that where we're unable to increase charges to to an amount that that will um, adequately cover um, costs and a bit more where possible, so we are we are very much working um, and continue to work with the other organisations that we have contracts with in making sure that we review those contracts going forwards and renegotiate terms to make sure that that we uh, meet those costs. Thanks. I remember that. Oh, microphone, Councillor Paul. Um, I remember that sort of strategy being part of the discussions but when will we get a sort of report on the outcome of if you like contract re renegotiations and to, to, to you know to see the actual benefit of that i wasn't proposing to bring a specific report on it uh, i was just sim simply proposing to make sure that within my remit which is to make sure that we that there's this value in the contracts that we provide that that continues to be the case um we, we, which i'm very much on top of um so I, I wouldn't be proposing to bring a specific report but i can certainly answer any questions from members about that well i think i'll put put you on notice that i will be asking questions <laughs> as we go forward and we all trend being put on notice by councillor paul um Reem, yeah, to... yeah. I was, I was just going to add. Um, these are the type of discussions you can take place in the SBR as well, isn't it? You know, they're 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 core to the service that Matt runs. So, so it, it may be more apt to raise and have a more informal discussion around these things at the SBR. Are you content, Councillor Paul? Thank you. Okay. Any more questions, members? No. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, Councillor Hannah. I would just like to say, Dioc, because I have done some of your Welsh courses and I'm afraid I'm still um, speaking in English here. But um, <laughs> I was expecting I Welsh am, there, Councillor no, Hannah. No, you're not going to get that for a while, but okay. I do understand a lot more when I hear it, even though I don't feel confident to speak. So thank you. Dear Councillor Hannah. We've got Gwenol online. Councillor Gwenol. Uh, Thank you, Chair, for letting me speak, although I'm not a member of this committee. I'd just like to congratulate Nia and Lynette and Aaron and everyone who was involved in this report. Uh, excellent work is going on here in Conway with regards to the Welsh language. We have learners, we have people in the beginning of the journey and people who are almost uh, fluent. And I've had the pleasure of supporting one of those learners. And as Hannah said there, she understands more Welsh now than she did two years ago. And I would encourage anyone who can speak Welsh to use their Welsh language in meetings because by hearing the language you pick up on these words and before i uh, finish i'd just like to refer to a day i uh, attended in upper conway school on the 25th of june where the school was celebrating the welsh language and celebrating the fact that they uh, received a silver award from the uh, language charter. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Upper Conway School, it is uh, a lesson for all of us how to uh, promote the Welsh language and how to celebrate the language. Excellent work there. Thank you very much. Councillor Nia online. 
Uh, Thank you, Chair. And I'd just like to add to what Councillor Gwennell had said. Thanks as well to Councillor Aaron and Nia for their uh, excellent work uh, making and uh, creating this strategy. I think it's, uh, it does catch your eye. I think it's exciting. And I like the way that Nia and her team and Councillor Aaron have responded to the uh, disappointing results in the uh, 2021 census, um, which showed that there was less uh, Welsh speakers in the county now. So I think that responding to that is very good. Um, I'm happy to approve of this strategy and I'd like to ask the cabinet to approve of it as well so that we can put it in pla into place as soon as possible. Thank you. That was a proposal for the report. Lovely. And before we ask for a second, Matt just wanted to pop in for a minute. Speak from Welsh, Matt. Uh, Jock and Fowler, uh, Chair, um, yeah, ju ju just to reiterate, I know Councillor Aaron has already um, thanked, um, obviously, Nia and Alinid, but also uh, Fran Lewis and Andy Wilkinson for their input into the strategy, which arises from them volunteering to attend the ROI Mount Gulad Vuedog uh, programme, the, the leading a, a bilingual country programme, and I think that that has... It, it, they've really put a lot of work into assisting us with that to make sure that the tone and the learning that we've had from taking part in that very important programme has come across into the stat strategy. So I just want to uh, reiterate those thanks. Uh, but also um, Maggie Williams within um, Fran's team who who designed the actual look of the, the strategy, which I personally and I hope members will agree, thinks looks absolutely great so i i just wanted to extend my my thanks and, and reiterate the thanks that uh Councillor had already um already given thanks chair so we've had a proposal from um councillor near about the recommendations could i have a seconder please councillor hannah would members like to show in favor please that three online oh four four online okay and anybody against any abstentions no that's carried deal members we now move on to item 10b the welsh language standards annual report pages 96 to 125 it's again uh councillor aaron win and nia to to uh present councillor aaron <clears throat> um, yeah, you, yes, this is a different report. The first item looked at what we were looking to do in the future, and this looks back at what we have been doing over the past year. So the purpose of this report is to show the extent to which the Council has complied with the Welsh language standards during 2023 and 2024, and this is a statutory uh, requirement for the Council. I'm glad to say that the Council does conform with all of the 167 standards. By the next report, I hope that the new strategy will be a part of this. The Welsh language is a, an important part of the Council's work and the translation service continues to promote the Welsh language successfully throughout the Council and the County. And it's brilliant to see in the report so many staff who have uh, took advantage of the Welsh language lessons and I'm glad to this report. Thank you. I'm sure you've heard enough of my voice this morning, so I'm going to pass you on to Lynette to present this report. Thank you, Nia, and thanks, Councillor Aron. As Councillor Aron has said, the purpose of this report is to show the extent to which the Council has complied with the Welsh language standards and the good work we have done to meet them. This is a statutory requirement for us as a Council this report forms part of the provision of the Welsh language in Conway, but there are a host of other strategies, such as More Than Words, the strategy for the Welsh language in education, 
and the strategy for the promotion of the Welsh language, which is the one we've just heard Mia speaking about. You will see that many developments and progress have been has been made in the past year, and you can see this in 3.1 of the report. These include uh, the Welsh Language Strategic Forum, continuing with the celebrating the Welsh language in Conway newsletter, developing the internet, the Conway education website, and the Welsh language website. The Welsh work scheme continues to go from strength to strength. The aim is to strengthen the Welsh language skills in the workplace. As part of this scheme, 78 members of staff have taken advantage of the provision. We have three, uh, sorry, four courses, um, entry, intermediate and advanced. We also updated the information about Welsh, uh, the Welsh skills levels of staff to, to make it easier for staff to choose the correct level for them. We continue to collaborate with schools in our county. We had the Wales Music Day project again this year with primary and secondary schools. I'm glad to say that 12 primary schools and four secondary schools took part in this project and the feedback was very positive. You will see in point 3.2 of the report what we would like to develop over the next year. As you have already heard, this year the uh, council made a successful bid to take part in um, the leading in bilingual country this helps us to uh, create the new strategy to promote the Welsh language. We are looking forward to uh, publish the report and uh, operating it over the next few years. We are also looking forward to developing the Welsh Language Strategic Forum over the year and also developing Welsh lessons within the Council as we are planning to offer two new access courses and these are for fewer beginners. So today we ask you to consider and scrutinize this report and if you are happy to recommend that the cabinet approve of it. Thank you for listening and if you have any questions, we'll try our best to answer them. Thank you. Okay then, there's questions please. Councillor Paul, you never let me down. Um, can I ask a, a specific question and, and and tell me if it's it's not appropriate? Um, the the issue that slightly concerns me is um, our children and parents who are going through the uh, additional learning needs process. So from identification and assessment in school all the way through the system to maybe an individual development plan, an IDP. Can you reassure me that those Welsh-speaking children and parents get a comparable, robust, rigorous service as English-speaking children and parents? Councillor, I don't think we've got anyone here from education, but I would be really happy for that to go as a question to education and and skills. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it is it is more of a technical question for education. I don't think the the, the language officers will be in a position to answer that specific question. Well, I suppose the reason I'm asking that are your colleagues fully engaged in if you like ensuring that is happening because if it isn't happening i'm assuming they would come to you no, this will be a wasp responsibility this would be covered by education um although there's consultative elements of with the welsh language team it, it is led by education so I'm, i don't think it's a fair question to ask the individual officers here i mean uh, dawn has got an update for us on, on that ah yeah council paul the west the welsh and education strategic plan is actually coming to education next tuesday evening so there. maybe that won't be the i'll ask question. it there yeah that's thank you council thank you paul Th thank you for that thank you um any more questions on this report mm -hmm. No. Okay. Well, 
you, Councillor Dillwyn is going to propose at the recommendation 2.1 that um, FNR consider and note the contents of the report and recommend the report for approval by Cabinet. So it's being proposed. Could I have a seconder, please? Councillor Sharon, would everyone like to show? And anybody against? Any abstentions? No, that's carried. Deal. Right, we now move on to item 11A, the foster friendly policy, pages 126 to 136. Um, who's going to present this one? Is it? Oh, Councillor Chris had his hand up. Councillor Liz. Bite it out between yourselves. <laughs> yeah, you start, Liz, and then I'll. I'll be the sidekick. <laughs> I'm apologising that I will be presenting this report in English, but that's what I'm going to do this morning. Thank you. I'm very pleased to bring this report before the scrutiny committee this morning for members to support and make recommendations to Cabinet to approve the policy that Conway County Borough Council become a foster friendly authority. Becoming a friendly, fo fo friendly fostering authority would ensure that as an authority, we will be compliant with Foster Wales, national target for all local authorities in Wales to become a foster friendly employer by 2025. This would also open up the opportunity for Conway County as the largest employer in the county to be leading the way and encouraging other employers, companies and businesses to become a foster friendly employer for Foster Wales. This policy has at its intention to remove barriers for the authorities employees to become foster carers for Foster Wales. Conway by providing the special leave to employees who are prospective and existing foster carers and connected person foster carers, plus being a positive recruitment strategy to attract Conway employees to become foster carers. So before I hand over to Steph Robbins, Head of Children and Family Services and Ellen Dickin, Section Manager, Children Looked After, to share the report, I'll hand over to Councillor Chris. Uh, um, yes, I'm, I'm part of the uh, introduction to this um, for you this morning because HR is an important part of my cabinet portfolio remit and I really hope the policy will be supported by you this morning. Um, as councillors have said, it's part of our aim to become a foster friendly authority. Uh, compensating our valuable carers in this way will be a strong message to include in our recruitment drives and will ensure uh, that time spent on training, reviews, meetings, attendance and everything won't have to come out of uh, staff's ordinary leave allowance. I think that's very important that they're compensated for that. Uh, if we can reduce reliance on high cost profit making independent fostering providers, mm -hmm. then uh, this will be a big win on balance for the authority. So thank you. Hello, Councillor Chris. Steph, would yeah. you like to? Have well, it's actually going to be Catherine McKenzie. It's, so it's Cathy who will be a service okay. manager for children looked after. Who's um, who's actually brought this report? Yeah. Oh, oh yes, oh, there you go. Uh, um, both of these reports you'll hear today are aiming to support. Oh, sorry, I could hear myself. <laughs> Right. Both of these reports you'll hear today are aiming to support our need to increase our general foster care cohort, and both reports complement one another. As everyone is aware, there's a rising cost and sufficiency challenge to accommodate children, especially being able to keep them in their own area and to remain connected with family, friends and school. Whilst we work with families to sustain the home environment where safe and appropriate to do so, we still need to increase foster care placements to support our most vulnerable children, keep siblings together and remain in our local communities and be able to live in a home with a family when their needs uh, can be best met 
rather than within a residential setting. So the foster care friendly policy is intended to remove the barriers for Conway employees to become foster care a foster carer for Foster Care Wales Conway and will demonstrate that Conway are supportive employers in Wales. The policy recognises the additional commitments and demands of caring for children looked after by providing special paid leave to employees who are prospective and existing foster carers and connected persons foster carers for Conway, for Foster Wales Conway. If agreed, it will be a positive recruitment strategy to attract Conway employees to become foster carers and to demonstrate Conway's commitment to foster carers. And it will also demonstrate to other large employers in the area, such as health and the police, that being a foster care friendly employer is to be recommended and celebrated. If adopted, the policy would allow Conway employees who are foster carers to claim up to five days special paid uh, leave and this will enable them to undertake their training and attend meetings, which would benefit their skills and practice in looking after the child or the young person. Consequently, they would not be faced with the dilemma of using annual leave intended for wellbeing and family life to attend training. Data gained from HR is that there's 4,769 permanent or fixed term employees, which are in a large, which are a large group of potential foster carers. And five days of special paid leave may encourage uh, applicants to consider fostering for Foster Wales Conway, as opposed to an independent profit making fostering provider. Becoming a foster friendly authority would also ensure we are compliant with Foster Care Wales national target for all local authorities in becoming foster friendly employee uh, employer by 2025. Whilst being one of the largest employers in Conway, Conway County Borough Council would be leading the way, as Councillor Liz said, for other employees, companies and businesses. The resource implication is to the individual service or the teams of up to five days leave for an employee away from their service. Where an employee is in a role that requires cover as a result of the additional leave, there will be an additional direct cost to the council equivalent to five days pay. And so just to it for illustrative purposes, based on a GO7 pay grade, this would cost around £880 per year. The option for the report is for members to approve, amend, or deny the, uh, the sorry, approve uh, the revised po policy. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments uh, uh, around this. Thank you very Thank you. much, Kath. We really welcome this this report. Um, members, first one, Councillor Stephen. Yeah, I'd like to propose that we go with the report today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Hannah. Thank you for the report that's just been presented. Um, can I, can you pass on our particular thanks to the four current staff that you've had that have already taken on this role without having that additional time for the, the time needed for meetings is, is quite important and it shouldn't be coming out of the annual leave that you would expect them to be spending as a pleasurable family time with, with the family that they're, that they're, they're looking after. Um, and I think the positive message is really important. We're a massive employer. We've got some absolutely marvellous staff. If we can actually make it a little bit easier that they can attend those meetings without taking up their own holiday time, then that's what we should be doing. And again, I'd like to um, emphasise the message that that gives to other employers that it's, this should be the norm. It shouldn't be a special thing. It should just be the normal thing that we do. Thank you. So I would second that. Lovely. Thank you, Councillor Hannah. Any any questions from anyone? Oh, Councillor Frank. Thank you, Chair. And also thank you for the report. Um, how difficult is it for disabled children or children that are less able to be fostered? That's it. It's certainly more challenging to find foster carers who are willing and who have the right um, environment and the right kind of housing. Um, we have this year recruited a short breaks um, recruitment officer. So we're still working and hoping that we can find those very special foster carers 
who will provide that role because it we do recognise it as being one of the most important things um, for families to get that that respite uh, that they they need. So it is challenging. It's challenging to find a foster carer, and even more so to find somebody with those special skills to work with somebody with a disability. Um, but we we we're onto it, aren't we, Ellen? And we're working tirelessly to try and find those special people in our in our um, county. Uh, thank you for that answer, and I do appreciate the difficulty. That's why I asked the question because children with severe disabilities are demanding, are demanding, yet they have the same rights as every other child. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Frank. And next is Councillor Sean online. No, no, and sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, so anybody else with any questions, observations? Oh, Councillor Penny. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that detailed report and all that you do. Could I just ask, you mentioned the health board and other similar large employees. Are we liaising with them to show our good practice in the hope that we can encourage children in our county to be fostered or adopted, please? Um, so in terms of our networking, so Methy Cymru have been doing a lot of work alongside um, other big partner organisations. We've got Colin Clandreslo and Menai, who's already um, signed up to being a foster friendly for you. So our hope is that the more we launch it in our individual local authorities and the connections that we have with the health board and with other education settings will really support this development. Thank you, Councillor Penny. Um, if we've got no more comments, can I just clarify, Councillor Stephen, you propose that we make the recommendations 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and Councillor Hannah, that's what you say. Lovely. Okay. So if everyone would like to show in support of this. And five on, and five online. Anybody against? No. Nope. Okay, no abstentions either. So that's carried. Thank you very much, everyone. We now move on to, let's have a look, 11B, implementing new incentives for foster carers. And this is Councillor Liz to present and Cathy to take the report again. Thank you. Dear Councillor Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, this, this second paper this morning is regarding implementing new incentives for foster carers and to enhance the council's offer to foster carers. This will complement the foster friendly policy which relates to foster carers who are also employees of the council. As we know, the aspirational aim of this authority is to reduce our dependency on commissioning independent fostering and residential placements in line with the Welsh Government bill to eliminate profit and to increase in-house capacity. As we know, Wales and other parts of the UK are experiencing challenges in ensuring there are enough foster carers to meet needs, and the growth in this sector remains below the identified need, and therefore we need to consider developing more incentives to draw more inquiries and approvals to foster in Conway. The incentives which uh, Cathy McKenzie will share with you today will make fostering more financially viable for some residents and may even attract those currently fostering with an independent fostering agency to transfer over to Conway. This is consistent with other local authorities who are adopting similar strategies. And I always remember, and I must say, it's always a joy to meet foster, foster carers, uh, and I enjoy going to those meetings that we have. Um, and as one foster carer said to me, without us, you cannot run an effective service. And they are quite right. We are indebted to the support of our foster carers in Conway, who we know bring quality to our service delivery. So, Cathy, I'll let you re uh, share the report, please. Deal. Deal. Thanks, uh, in 2023, the Cabinet approved a minimum fee increase for carers, offering a single placement and an improved fee for foster carers who with more than one foster child in their placement. 
uh, and in order to encourage existing experienced foster carers to take on one more child. So in addition to the rele to relevant fees, the council currently also we still provide the Fit Conway membership uh, to our foster carers. So it's now proposed to extend the incentives given with the introduction of up to 100% discretionary relief in council tax, where the foster carers uh, from Conway County Borough Council, uh, where the foster carer is on the Conway County Borough Council tax council tax register. Foster carers will be given a choice also of six different Conway County Borough Council parking permits for free as part of Conway's foster care service. It, it is to be noted that this incentive will be considered for foster carers transitioning to new special guardianship orders following the financial assessment being completed. Now, this package of incentives, in addition to relevant fees, will make foster, fostering financially more viable for some residents, and it may even attract those currently fostering with an independent fostering agency to transfer over to Conway. This is consistent with other local authorities who are adopting similar strategies. The existing 45 carers and 26 connected persons foster carers are in receipt of, of the incentive benefits from approval. So they would start uh, from when we approve them. That an additional 10 foster carers, we're gonna try to recruit an additional foster carer uh, each year. That properties subject to discretionary relief are, are band B and D dwellings Note the actual relief will be based on the actual property banding and figures based on the 24-25 council tax band D of a rate of £2,135.86, including the police and crime commissioner's precept and the 24-25 county-wide parking permit cost of £292. Please see the report. We've got all the details of the finances within the report. In-house foster care generally costs uh, four, 468 pound eight pence per placement. That's not inclusive of the core staffing uh, that we, we recruit. Uh, in comparison, the independent foster care agency would cost us 989 pound per week but that's because that includes all of their management and everything. So if we made a new place to an IFA, it would be 989. If we can make a placement to foster care, it's 468. The council tax discount will result in a reduction in actual income for the council. Whilst initially this will be an additional pressure, which can be funded within the council tax budget, in subsequent years, the aim is for this to be funded from the reduction in independent placement costs for children that are looked after. However, it is worth noting that the issue of the car parking permits is more of an opportunity cost, as a foster carer may not otherwise purchase a permit or incur parking fees, and therefore there's no direct impact on the council's budget. Foster carers will be given the option to choose a permit that covers the promenade and the streets, or for all the council car parks to suit their needs. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll try and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for that, Cathy. Yes, the report very, very dear to my heart. Um, ju yeah, just a quick observation before we go um, out to question. I personally don't think this report goes far enough in terms of the um, monies that we can offer to our our foster carers because we know don't we the massive individual cost to the child and cost to the authority and i'm really concerned um through my work with the adoption panel and meeting with colleagues um last month how concerned we are about the welsh government directive the taking the profit out of care we're really getting squeezed in wales now aren't we it's getting very very difficult to place our children and i think we should really be looking at much more hikes to our fees in terms of a spend to save both in terms of the well-being of our children young people and in terms of the financial savings it'll bring us so I, you know I, I passionately urge members to look at that when we're doing the budget setting for next year that should be a consideration both the human cost and the um 
the financial costs that this is coming down the, the, the line at us. So thank you. Um, first, Councillor Charlie. Yeah, Diolf Kader, I'm just talking with my finance portfolio head on. I, I do recognise what you're saying. Um, there will be a cost, obviously, in lost council tax, but the potential gains, both for those young people and for our budget line, it would, would be... Um, you know, substantially more. We're seeing um, costs for residential care, 10, 15, 20,000 pounds a week. So even removing one or two of those gives us the ability to do the other services, such as the weeds and things that, you know, our residents value as well. Um, it, it's a good start, I think, you know, it, it's yeah. something that we can monitor. I, I would point out that any fees that we pay would obviously be subject to taxation. They can move people in different sort of bands and stuff. That this is a, is, is a complete saving, isn't it? So it's a, it's, it's substantial a substantial benefit more than the actual net figure that they would save. But something I'm really keen to monitor uh, and you know look and see what works and what doesn't work. But it is absolutely a step in the right direction. I really want to thank the officers for bringing it forward. So deal. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, um, we're seeing, aren't we, the, the rise of formal agencies in England that are we, we're having to use here, and it just seems it just seems completely wrong. And I think we need a real long, hard look at this and a and a reset. So, um, questions. We've now got Councillor Harry online and Councillor Paul. Councillor Harry. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to continue to pick up on, on the theme the leader just mentioned about the financing for this. Um, I appreciate what, what officers have explained that. It will hopefully be a spend to save. Um, I, I was just hoping if I could just go through some figures uh, from the report as I understand them. Um, perhaps um, officers could, could tell me if I'm um, wrong or if I've got anything significantly amiss. So uh, I'm just looking at paragraph 3.16. You've got the financial impact. Uh, it's the same paragraph that includes the table. So from, from what I can understand here, um, essentially an independent foster care agency per week will cost an extra £521. So the, the assumptions in here are that you're working on 10 foster carers, that's where the figures are, are, are based on, and obviously you're 52 weeks a year. So if we times that figure by 10 and times by 52, that gets us to um, perhaps a saving of around 270, 271 thousand pounds per year. Now, obviously, if we look at the expenditure outlined in table one, uh, it's got for this year, and conscious comments made that there perhaps be a financial pressure initially, but it would it, it it would save money over time. But you've got initially that that projected cost of one seven two four four nine. Totally take the point about um, parking permit cost being a um, opportunity cost, but let's just go for that figure of one seven two four four nine. So I'm I'm assuming that based on spend to save, let's say if we could begin realizing that this year we're looking at probably saving around £100,000 per year based on the assumptions in, in the report. I'm, I'm just hoping officers can tell me whether or not that's right or whether or not I'm I'm really adrift with the figures I've I've got there. Thank you, Councillor Harry. I think Amanda's going to come in on the finance. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Harry. Um, yeah, I, 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 guess, um, I guess if you... The figures that you're quoted, that obviously the table at the moment doesn't doesn't show uh, the saving side of it. It only shows the cost uh, of the current cohort of foster carers plus an anticipation of t an additional seven year and what that would cost. Um, obviously, if all of those people were drawn from uh, foster carers that currently work for independent agencies across to being foster carers that work for us, then then those savings that you refer to, the difference between the 989 and the 468, uh, times by week, then offsetting the the actual additional cost because the council tax is, is correct. But the reason I the reason the table doesn't show that is because you know there isn't a direct link in the context of the foster carers we attract. Uh, the the existing foster carers we have obviously uh, don't currently work for ind independent placements. They are currently our foster carers. <laughs> Those ones we attract may come from an independent placement, but they may come from another source. So, um, but the, but I I think the bigger savings ultimately are actually in the savings uh, of independent placements, um, not with foster carers, but independent placements in residential, where, as Charlie says, you know, we we uh, are spending, 
you know, I think at a good at a good level, we're spending ten thousand pound a week. At a at an extreme level, we're spending thirty thousand pound a week uh, for a child to be in an independent residential pro placement. So actually, uh, you can see if we could just get one or two children, uh, and I appreciate, um, you know, it may be at the at the uh, less complex end and therefore the lower end, but even you know one mm -hmm. or two children saving ten thousand pound a week uh, and turning that into this kind of cost, you can clearly see that the financial benefits would be uh, significant to us as an authority. Um, the reason, you know, I think at this stage we've got to recognise that to an extent we're making a, a, a sort of a quasi speculative investment here mm -hmm. by by off making this offer and making this incentive available in order to attract foster carers and therefore, you know, hopefully then have actually better outcomes for the children, uh, more importantly, but actually uh, the potential to then make those significant financial savings uh, uh, for us as an authority. Thank you for that, Amanda. Um, you content, Councillor Harry? Yeah, I'm, I'm really content with that. I get Amanda's point that obviously we, we you've got to make a judgment call without having all of the figures you necessarily have at, at this point in time but of course you've, you've got to do that with anything I think the support is really positive I think it's a really good way forward um has the has recommending this to cabinet been proposed yet just yet. Me. Has, I'm happy to propose that then chair excellent. yeah excellent thank you very much yes I mean yeah we've got Councillor Paul next. Yes, I, I mean we've and we've also got to stop any more of our in-house foster carers um, defecting to private agencies. We absolutely have to because the quality of care that our foster um, care providers within Conway is is second to none. They do amazing work, mm -hmm. and so worrying to see that you know some of them going to these private agencies for for more remuneration, and it's a very worrying situation. I'm glad everyone's agreed with that we should look at this further. So next, Councillor Paul. Yeah, I just want to drill down on this a bit more. I'm totally supportive of this and, and will vote for it. But I think um, our residents do under, need to understand uh, this speculative of investment, as it's been described. Um, so looking at paragraphs 317 and 318, um, Obviously, in this financial year, 2024-25, um, in a sense, this is going to be an, an overspend. I know you're saying this, which can be funded within the council tax budget, but basically it, it, it's income which we were, were expecting and now we're not expecting. And therefore, in your August report to this committee, I, I think this will come under your section where there are further over, overspends. Um, and if in subsequent years this um, we, we don't make the progress which we're hoping, then we need to make it clear that this will have to be first call on a council tax increase for 2025-26. So we, we, we need to be honest about that, because um, if we don't get these savings, council tax is, is going to have to go up to, to, to meet these these costs. Um, and of course, as, as you've reported today, for some of these children, we're spending um, well over a million pounds a year on one child, 30K times by 52 is actually near one and a half million a year. Now, I'm not saying there are many children in that category, but it is, it is just, it has to happen. I'm totally supportive to it happening, but it is eye-watering these costs. And I think um, our residents need to understand, you know, the explicit details of this. It is, it is very, very, very very profound um and there are no easy answers and um to lighten the mood a bit i may well be arguing in future <laughs> when i i won't spend money spent on something this is more of an opportunity cost <laughs> which of course uh, um we don't know how that works through the system either 
So, you know, we, you know, this is serious business here today, but I would like to just have my analysis confirmed or challenged by Amanda or, or Charlie, um, if I'm misunderstanding it. Thank you, Councillor Paul. You've clearly made Councillor Charlie's day, haven't you, there? He's looking forward to next February already. Right, Amanda, please. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so in, in terms of the uh, the council tax, then as, as you rightly say, that is genuine income that we would otherwise be receiving, which we are now going to forego uh, with the implementation of that of this policy. Um, and and obviously, you know, being absolutely, uh, you know, everything being clear about about the about everything, the hundred and fifty one thousand that that's in the report may not be the exact figure because I've assumed for the purposes of the calculation that all of those foster carers are in band D properties. Now, obviously, they may not be. Some might be in a band B property. Some might be in C. Some might be in E and F properties. I I don't know. So so. On the assumption that everyone on average is in a bandy property, then it will cost us 151,000 in year one. And as you say, that is genuine income that we will forego. Where I say it can be funded within the council tax budget, um, the reason I've said that is because, uh, and when, when the outturn report comes in front of you, you'll see that we actually have um, a, a surplus on the council tax collection of, of around four to five hundred thousand pounds, and therefore there is that headroom. But of course, in the current budget round, that 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 over collection, as it were, has then funded other things. So clearly, if you take this out, then it's not available to fund other things. But however, um, it, it well, and and also actually just to just to also uh, further sort of emphasize on council tax you know we we have also currently uh, recently been doing a, a review of our uh, single person discount entitlement etc and we're confident actually that that's going to yield more income now because you know what happens over time is people uh, you know claim a claim a single person discount and then their personal circumstances change but maybe they forget to tell us uh, and and we refresh that etc so we're hopeful of of, of of income there so I'm I'm confident we can cover it but but as you say it, it nonetheless means that it's it's not available for using elsewhere where. But I think we have to then put it in the context of of the real potential it has uh, in the context of being an incentive for a foster carer. So, so you know, just to also point out that, you know, in giving a, a, a council tax discount of, of um, a bandy property, £2,000, actually, in terms of somebody's taxable income, that's actually, if they're a 20% taxpayer, that would be equivalent to 2700 in gross income. Uh, and if they were a 40% taxpayer, it would be equivalent to £3,500. So, you know, quite significant in terms of in terms of what it would mean. Um, um, but just one child moving out of, say, a £10,000 a week um, independent residential placement would save us £520,000. So just one child. So attracting one more foster carer who can provide a much better quality outcome for that child will have for us that huge financial benefit. So yes, it's speculative, but it's, it's, it's speculative based on uh, what I would believe to be sensible, well-informed judgment around the real benefits, both as I say, most importantly for the outcome of the child, but but the real benefits for us financially, uh, and 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 you know, and I'm I absolutely endorse what what Councillor Shell was saying in the sense of actually I think we need to be very ambitious in our program of trying to attract you know and 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 you know I I recognise uh, you know uh, what the service is saying in terms of how difficult it is to attract, but you know I think we've got to do everything we can to attract as many and as quickly as we can uh, because because it has such benefits both for, for the child and for us as in, in terms of our budget. So, you know, I feel very comfortable that what we're proposing is a is a very sensible thing to do, notwithstanding it has a speculative edge to it at this point in time. Thank you, very much. Thank you for that full explanation. I think it's important that, that that's in the public domain. Uh, uh... Thank you very much, members. We've got next Councillor Sharon, then Councillor Hannah, then Councillor David. Thank you. Um, like Paul, I'm going to vote for this and I'm very supportive um, of, of the plan. I think it's great. And 
uh, after hearing what Amanda said, that just one child would save us 520, that's great. But for me, I know very little about the work you do. Um, what I would like to have seen attached to the report was something that tells me um, how you're going to communicate with the other adoption agencies to try and encourage them to come over to Conway. And um, also a communications plan for the enhanced packages that we're going to be offering anybody that does come over to Conway. I would just like to see attached to all reports actually, um, some sort of plan, some sort of smart mm. plan that tells us, uh, and I know it's difficult for you to target how many um, new foster carers you, you're hoping to get, um, but just something that gives a little bit more depth really as to how we're gonna communicate mm. to the, the, um, the, the wider community. Thank you. Thank you for that really good point, Steph. Councillor Sharon. Steph? Um, we have a placement commissioning strategy, which I'm more than happy to share, um, that we've constructed, which involves the number of carers that we're trying to recruit. It also um, alludes to we've got a transformation programme, which we've brought um, here many a time to discuss and update about. Um, and we also have our newsletters. So things like that we, will be quick shares, quick comms plans. In terms of our work with the independent fostering agencies, um, we have within Wales the four C's framework um, and they're working alongside us with the eliminate profit bill they're the ones that have the direct communication with the independent placements and they know the plans that by 2027 those agencies need to go to not-for-profit because of the new bill um, and the four c's consortium are working with us and the agencies to say which of those agencies are continuing to um, transfer over to not-for-profit or which will be ceasing and they then share information with us as local authorities to make contact with those foster carers. In terms of the way that we share the information we wouldn't go directly to the independent fostering agencies because we're not in the business to poach. It has to be somebody's desire to come and work for the local authority and we feel quite strongly about that. What we have is really successful recruitment marketing campaigns. And um, we do that on a regional and a local basis. And um, we have two recruitment officers currently, and we're all on all the social media platforms and we're getting out um, into the communities as well. So we're hoping by being able to demonstrate that one, we're foster friendly, two, that we've got increased incentives to offer our foster carers through that comms plan, um, we'll be able to naturally just get more inquiries and some natural transfers over from those independent agencies. Thank you for that. Um, and that, that's fantastic. But as I said, I know very little about how you operate your area of, of business. Um, so I still would like to have seen just a paragraph, a, a pricey of the information that you've just given. It just gives um, somebody like me, who's a bit of a novice, um, just that added depth and, and those added reasons and and really a better insight I, and i don't mean a great big in depth uh, you know maybe just a pricey with a couple of links so if any any of us want to have a look further there is the opportunity to find that information very quickly but thank you thank you councillor thanks for that steph um and i think we also need to have an eye as well on <laughs> a further training budget because I, I i know from experience that that the amount of training that our in-house foster carers have bring them up to a fantastic standard and i haven't always noticed um that in in, in the private um agencies which i know is well documented isn't it so councillor liz wanted to pop in there and, and answer thanks very much thank you councillor sharon i mean as members in these scrutiny committees, one is expected to know an awful lot, basically. And it's not until you are a cabinet member that you get to know that real in depth and you see the work happening. But I'm quite sure that Steph will welcome you to come along at any time and to have a better understanding of yeah. what we're trying to achieve. And that's open to any member, isn't it? So thanks very much indeed for raising it. Dear of Councillor Liz. Councillor Hannah. Yeah, um, the finances to me make sense. Amanda's explained them very clearly. 
Um, and I also look forward to profit making being removed from uh, the care of our children in this county uh, and in the whole of Wales. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd like to second this. I believe I've not heard someone second yet. There is a proposer. Is that? Oh, well, that's great. That Thank right? you, I'd like to second. And the reason I want to second it is because it's the right thing to do for our children. Uh, the children in Conway, it's the right thing to do. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hannah. So we have a proposal and seconder. Next, we've got questions from Councillor David. Thank you, Chair. On uh, special guardianships, could you just run through what happens once the guardianship is granted? Do we follow up? Do, do, do we actually look to make sure that the birth parents have the contact that they're entitled to? Because I've got a few concerns that once the special guardianships are made, then social services seem not to be as involved. So could you just run me through what happens after special guardianship and what steps are taken to make sure that it's working and uh, that the birth parents have, have their rights? Thank you. If you could just briefly answer that, Steph. Um, and if it's OK, I'd like to have that separate discussion outside because it's not in connection yes. to the incentives. So if that's OK with yourself. Oh, that's fine. I can that's have fine. that discussion yeah. directly with yourself. Yeah, thank you, Councillor David. Bit of a sensitive thing to, to go in. Yeah. And we're looking at the finances here this morning. So, Amanda, did you want to... No, are you done? Oh. I, I just want to make another observation. Okay, well, that's it for questioners at the moment. So, uh, come in. Yeah, my... Final observation uh, for, for for members, just to be clear. Obviously, if 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 you support this, and and obviously cabinet then subsequently support the incentive, uh, just to note then that uh, it requires the council tax discretionary policy to be amended, uh, because obviously we wouldn't be able to put the incentive in place without the policy supporting that, uh, and that would then be going in a report to council because it's a council decision uh, on the 18th of July. So just just to uh, make make that clear. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Well, before uh, we've had a proposal and second, can I just ask from this committee that um, we monitor this closely now and see what effect it has and look to have a report as soon as we know how this is working and the implications. That would be that would be brilliant. So we've had a proposer, we've had a seconder and its recommendations 2.1 and 2.2. If everyone would like to show in support. And that's everybody online as well. There's no one against, so that's carried unanimously. Just a huge thank you to you all. Thank you very much. Right, you'd be delighted to know we're now moving on to the final. Look at this, half 11, fantastic. 12A, Corporate Plan Performance Measures Proposals for 2024-2025. Councillor Chris Cater is going to introduce and Fran Lewis is going to present. So, dear Councillor Chris. Yep, dear Councillor Kadherid. As you know, Chair and members, we have a statutory duty to keep our performance under review in accordance with the Local Government and Elections Wales Act 2021. Our performance measures are reviewed annually and appropriate targets set. Everyone here today will agree uh, that we want to achieve our priorities and focus on improvement, but the impact of the current financial climate in local government, we're talking about that a lot today already, has to bring realism to the process. Um, available resources and capacity has never been so crucial. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Fran, who's sitting on my my right here, the head of people and performance, to take us through the report, um, and it, it'll be going to cabinet next week. Yep. Yes, Councillor Chris. Bonadar uh, Powell. Um, yeah, I'm um, just going to give you an overview uh, in terms of the report. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. So, as Councillor Chris said, we have a statutory duty to keep our performance under review. And members will be aware that 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 we're, we're we're pretty strong on that in terms of six monthly service performance reviews, um, as well as the um, mid year report and annual report, not just on the corporate plan, but on a variety of other of other strategic um, plans. Um, normally, we would present the uh, performance measures and and targets alongside the review of the 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 corporate plan. 
but um, as everyone's aware, it's been quite an unusual year, hence we're, we're just slightly out of sync. So this, this report is just playing a little bit of, of catch up. Um, and as Councillor Chris said, we'll go to Cabinet and then to Council for approval. So it's aligned with the corporate plan. Um, so we undertake a review of the corporate plan um, every year to make sure it's still relevant. And as part of that, not just looking at the actions, we always look look at the measures and are they appropriate. Um, as Councillor Chris said, that's done in conjunction with the leader, the relevant cabinet members and scrutiny chairs as part of this process. So it's about keeping the plan flexible so that we can add things, delete things, look at whether we can still afford things, um, but still um, keep our overall goal of making improvements um, for the communities that we serve. You'll um, notice within the pack that um, for some measures, um, it's not appropriate or meaningful to set um, a target. And that can be for a number of reasons, such as it's a measure that's not necessarily within our control, but it's a good indicator as to whether we're heading in the right direction. Um, it's also where we've introduced a new measure and we need a year to do a baseline um, assessment of where we're heading and the direction of travel. Um, it might be uh, where there are external factors affecting performance and we need to monitor and understand the trend or um, where, where, where we're, we're growing more um, away from uh, data. We've also included um, qualitative measures um, and as you will be aware, uh, qualitative as well as quantitative are important measures to show are we making a difference? So the full list of measures and proposed changes are within the appendix. Um, as I said, it's fairly self-explanatory. Proposed changes are highlighted um, in red and proposals to remove a measure are shaded um, in grey. Uh, you will note that for a number of measures, uh, the data for last year, 22-23, um, is available um, and for um, quite a few areas, the outturn for 23, 24 um, is still being collated. Just to provide you with reassurance, the SPRs finish um, at the end of this month and you will be provided with that outturn data as part of um, the annual report, which will be coming um, through democracy. I'm looking at dawn, I think September through to, through to um, October. I won't go through uh, the appendix in detail, but I also wanted just to give assurance to members that these are the measures that relate to the corporate plan. There's a whole host of data out there. I'm sure you're all familiar and have a good look around the dashboards on Data Cymru's website. It's a joy to go on there. Highly recommend it. Can't wait. Um, yeah, yeah, top tip. Um, as well as obviously the measures and performance that come within various other strategies. So just to bear that in mind that the 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 appendix is not by any stretch everything that we do as an authority, but the corporate plan doesn't cover everything we do. It's about those things where we really want to make um, an improvement. And it will flex again. There's further work going on. There will be this autumn in terms of um, again, looking at the corporate plan and looking at the sense of direction and what's and what's affordable. And that may well include um, uh, measures to push performance, but also include measures to have a managed approach to pulling back or reducing service, as Councillor Chris said. Um, we'll have to look at it um, in both ways. Um, so that's all I wanted to say um, for now. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Chair, for any questions. Deal fan for that. Don't we love our corporate plan? Okay, members' questions. I'm sure you've all got lots. Oh, go on, Councillor Paul. Yeah, I've lost it for a moment, but there was a, Never. a section on um, diversity in democracy, which which does concern me because I do think we need to, to monitor this. And I, I say this as a as an older white man, uh, and I genuinely do say, if I, if I do stand in May 2027, I, I do hope that I have a, a range of diverse opponents um, that I am competing for votes for, because um, I think this is a very uh, important issue for the council 
it, it was actually very pleasing. I think it was yesterday uh, when I saw on the news the increased diversity in the Houses of Parliament. And I would personally like to see in this council chamber uh, younger people, uh, more women, more people uh, with protected characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I've lost a bit, but my understanding was we're not we're not going to sort of keep a, an annual record of our diversity, but I think we should be explicit about that in our in our reporting. You know, I think we should be saying we have so many men, women, uh, people with protected characteristics, etc. And I think that that should be sustained in this report so that that explicit information is out there. And I, I will I continually try and encourage young people to get involved in the democratic process and, and to stand. And, and I think um, it's something, if it's in this report, it shows we're serious about it. And I don't think it's too onerous to record that information annually on what the makeup of the council is. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. If I could come in, Chair, yeah, just just quickly. I, I, I you know, that uh, Councillor Paul's absolutely right. Um, there it sits, the measure 8.2 on page 170, um, a commentary measure which we're proposing to remove, but that's that's not because we're not taking this seriously and we're not gonna do the work. It's It's really, um, because it's covered in, in other measures. And I, I think if we could just have a look at the measure concerning our inclusive Conway plan actions, that's really important. And we are working on all those 800 lines in the anti-racist Wales plan. It's a big document and we're working through that and we will be putting a bit more resource into that as well. So I think I'll hand over to Fran now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Councillor Chris has covered it really. Um, uh, we do actually agree on this one, Councillor Paul. Um, yeah, uh, really important area, something that certainly the team are working really, really hard on. Um, we will be re-looking at the measures around um, uh, diversity and inclusion in, in general, probably moving away from the percentage of actions completed to something a bit more um, meaningful um, and absolutely we, we do uh, report on the diversity of the organisation um, every year in terms of staff um, but we are uh, learning and uh, we are working hard to look at um, what more can we do to be a more inclusive organisation and I'm very grateful for the senior support um, that, that we have for that so um a long journey ahead, I think. Um, but yeah, much more than just the data to look at to make sure that we are a, a welcoming and inclusive organisation. We may fall out, Fran. Uh, oh God, <laughs> go on. Can I, can I ask though, it's the explicit information that I want in the public domain. So I want to be able and, and to, if somebody says to me um, explicitly, you know, without me having to tot it up from the councillor list, how many women and men, how many people from ethnic minorities, how many people from the um, the other different communities, how how that is recorded and monitored, because I think that's what's important. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm just just looking at Dawn because, as I said, we do that every year from a staff point of view, but that doesn't include elected members. So I don't know if that's something you can answer. I don't, I don't know. We, hi, uh, the Democratic Services Committee. I know ha Councillor Harry has uh, got his hand up there. Yeah. They actually do uh, monitor the Diversity and Di Democracy Action Plan. So I think that's probably monitored there, and the Employment Monitoring Report. Is an annual report and it's coming in October and I'm sure it's got all those that information I'm sure it does doesn't it Fran? It's from a staff point of view but not, not members yet. and I think that's Councillor Paul's point that it's elected member data as well. 
Uh, thank you, Fran. I'm forward to declaring my interest then as a pensioner next year. That'd be great. Thank you. Oh, so, so sorry. So, so I, it will be there. Yeah. It yes. will be there. Yeah. I, I think that 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 was the point I was going to make. It, 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 it as Fran and and Councillor Chris said, not everything we do is in yeah. this document. So you will have a point of reference in other committees. Democratic services is the one for the point you're actually raising around the the um, diversity in democracy action plan, which is an incredibly important plan, um, especially as we move forward. Um, I don't want to remind everybody, but there will be an election in 2027. I, I don't, you don't want to think about Just elections. The at the e word, yeah. stop it. But but it, you know the plan leads up to that, doesn't it? And and it's incredibly important that we attract. Um, people from across all our society to put their names forward uh, uh, to be democratic leaders across the authority. So, yes, there will be a reference point. So I think that probably, I hope, will cover the point you're raising, Councillor Paul. The offering. Are you content, Councillor Paul? Yes, lovely. We'll next go to Councillor Harry online and Councillor Hannah in the chamber. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, was, I was going to say just just on the point that Paul raised, and I think I think the point made by Dawn is quite correct that that this information around the diverse council declaration and the diverse team democracy action plan does come through democratic services frequently. Um, I I am going to stick my head out here and say that I think there is a real need within this council to raise awareness around the diverse council declaration and some of the bits in it. it it's something that i'm very disappointed by actually i think we agreed back in 2021 uh, we all felt very pleased with ourselves for agreeing with it and then i think some of the some of the parts of that have been allowed to slip and we're not entirely focused on them as a council i mean one point i i'd raise is i'd be interested to know how many of our political groups in the council have actually appointed diversity ambassadors that was something within the initial diverse council declaration it's not something I hear a huge amount about uh, nowadays. Another one is around the scheduling of council meetings. We are supposed to have council meetings or formal meetings that are part of a democratic process uh, scheduled to allow members who may have caring or work commitments to be able to attend. Now, reference was made to the budget working groups earlier today and attendance at those. I wasn't able to attend many of those or any of them actually because I, I happened to work and they were all bar one scheduled for 9.30 in the morning on weekdays. Now, I know I've raised this with officers before and, and cabinet members and we seem to get repeating conflicting answers from whether it be the deputy leader, democratic services, the leader for councils to whether or not these meetings are actually part of a democratic process. So I, I think on the Die First Council aspect i i think it would be sensible if we remained cited on it um i can understand saying should we move the measure aspect of the uh, corporate plan reporting into the action aspect uh if that makes it easier to carry out that reporting um i i I would have no objection with that, but I think it is important that we do remain cited on it, um, because when um, certainly the Diverse Council Declaration was adopted by, by Conway, it achieved an awful lot of support, I think, on a very broad cross-party basis. It, we were encouraged to adopt it as best practice by the WLGA, and I think it's important that we stick to that. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Harry. I'm sure we'll take take that on board, I'm sure, and um, those points will will be taken up thank you especially yes the timing of the budget working groups i agree as a carer that was uh, that's the question for me thank you uh, we now have in the chamber got councillor hannah thank you um i'm looking at the notes on the housing and homelessness and i welcome that there is a bit more information there um i wonder whether that could be extended further um because I think there is a quite a misconception within the community as to who our homeless are, and it might be helpful if there was a little bit more information. But I also recognise that we're going to go into the realms of disclosing information as our homeless figures before, that we might be actually um, giving too much information out there. But I, I, I just wonder if we could maybe over the next year before this comes up in a year's time, 
just to look at whether there could be additional information to recognise the situations that our homelessness people have had happen and the reasons that, that, that they're needing it. So I'm, I'm welcoming the fact that, that there is more information there for us to, to glean from these figures. I'm also particularly pleased with the increase in the amount of cases of homelessness that we appear to have prevented lately, and that's some very good news. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Han. Yes, um, it's annual data not yet available throughout most of, of the housing measures, but I know that um, Katie is, is working hard on that and has not long been in, in post, so hopefully that data will be coming to us because it's a hugely important service and we hope that data will be coming to us soon. So, thank, thank you, Katie. Do have some of that um, up to date figures, and we have the SCR as um, Rian mentioned um, next week around housing and homelessness. And I think just to follow up on that point around this is the very high level we have rapid rehousing plan with lots of the more detail in, which we'll get, be able to share and come through and put on the website. The update. I'm sorry, Katie, I can hardly hear what you're oh, saying. Sorry. Shan. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> just to reiterate again what I think Rinda said earlier about that this is the very high level, but there's lots more detail within plans that we will make available once they're completed. So we have a rapid rehousing plan which has lots of detail about all the work around homelessness and increasing supply. And those updates will go onto the website and be available for, for, for people to see as well. Dear Katie. You happy, Councillor Hannah? Very. Lovely, thank you. Oh, well, that's nice. Monday morning. Okay, next is Councillor Anne online. Councillor Anne. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just sort of one question. I mean, I've, I've carefully listened to everything that's been said, and particularly um, Councillor Chris when he introduced the uh, the report, because um, he was talking about the appropriateness of measures being set and obviously that we want to achieve. Now, I'm a, I'm a big fan of reviewing performance and indeed a performance management. And, and obviously yesterday I was really disappointed because I had to abandon my attendance at uh, an SPR review because of the um the, the online um facility. It was just impossible to hear and to follow. And obviously I've I've given feedback on that. So, you know, I, I hope those comments will will be uh we acted upon. But in terms of this report, um I'm just looking. I've 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 I reviewed it um, when I was reading it, and you know, in terms of we've we've got sort of we've got six outcomes there, um, and out of the six outcomes, we've got forty seven measures, um, and only sixteen of them are, in my view, sort of specific. Um, an awful lot of them, um, I've got trend measure, I've got commentary, um, and so on, and this is really in essence a real important thing because it is is our vision of what we're trying to sort of change and to achieve in our, our current five-year term i mean on on page um 153 for example um m2.1 um says in 2022-23 the number of businesses supported were 59 um last year it was 18 and then what is the measure proposed here? What's well, trend measure, whatever that means. Now, I don't, I don't want to pick that part specifically, but if you just take my sort of follow my sort of my, my drift, it really is it really appropriate and is it really meaningful? And then if I look at M2.4, um, that's about the number of visitors in the winter months, i.e. October to February. For 2023, the figures are not there. Um, and that goes to Councillor point, Paul's point about the accessibility and availability of information. And then in terms of 2023-24, it says we haven't got the, the data available till the autumn. And then what's the target for this year? It's the trend measure. And I, I picked this, this page specifically because there's lots of good work within this report that's quantified and clarified and you know I, I you know that's very much uh, one something I want to stress but really it, my real question to Fran and the team is is having a third of these 47 measures really um the right balance thank you councillor Anne Fran councillor Chris one two uh, yeah, thanks, Councillor Anne. You know, re really valid um, comments. And, and as I said, as I presented the report, we, we will be re-looking um, at the corporate plan this, this autumn anyway. 
I guess um, the the reason uh, your examples of M two point one um, to two point four, why they're trend measures, is that we use that information to then do our self assessment of well, if that trend in terms of the number of businesses supported starts to drop we can then look at, well, what does that mean? What is it? Is it we're doing things wrong? Is there more that we need to be doing? Because the, the, the reason we've moved away from targets on everything is that they can be meaningless as well. They might look good on paper, but, but the number of businesses supported is very dependent on the businesses that come forward to ask for help, which is why it's a trend to look at, is that dropping off? Are we reaching enough? So, there will always be, as you notice in the annual report, an explanation of, of that measure. So those trend measures just help inform our assessment of are we making a difference? And without them, that would be very difficult to do. But it would also be meaningless to put a target um, against it as well, because it's dependent on those that step up and say um, we want uh, help. But as I said, we will be looking at um, the measures um, again this autumn. I think it's also important to note um, the new um, legal obligation in terms of our, our self-assessment. So as well as the annual report, some of the work that Amanda did before she left was integrating the self-assessment. So um, data, I, I am a big fan of data as well, um, but it has its place, doesn't it, as well as that self-assessment of well, so what, what does that mean and what are we doing with it? And that's definitely a shift that we're trying to make in, in all our data of, well, what's our advice and what is it that we need to change on the back of this data? So I hope that gives um, a better explanation. We, we want a broader breadth of information rather than just those measures where we can put a target um, against them. And I think I understand exactly what you're saying. <clears throat> and I suppose, Julia, before we come to publish this as a document, which is publishing our sort of measures for the year that we're currently in, I would hope I would really hope that we could do that self-assessment work um, or a substantial amount of it in advance of, of doing this exercise and then coming to scrutiny and asking us to scrutinise it. I mean, I, I do understand that we have to be flexible, but sometimes it's just a cut-off point because obviously if you're wanting to have some measures, there needs to be a point at which you make that sort of judgment call, isn't it? But you certainly you predicate it on self-assessment. So, you know, I, I just wanted to make, start the conversation really. And, and basically, I suppose my, my sort of feedback is, I think a third of measures where it's really not very clear um, what we're aspiring to, uh, whether it's for the public, for members, or indeed potentially maybe staff, I think it starts to become really meaningless in a way. So I'm pleased that it's under review um, and obviously look forward to something that is perhaps got the better balance. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Anne. Oh, yes, Ree wants to come in on that then, Councillor Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Anne, and uh, very valid um, points made. Uh, I just want to come back on the SPR point, and I, you know, I did email you, but it's, it's, yeah, I, I just like to apologise to those who attended online yesterday. The sound quality was incredibly poor. Um, I've already had a discussion with IT about it. Um, we will try and. I think it's the specific room and the amount of people who turned up to the SPR that was the issue. When when that room is full, it gets really difficult to hear uh, all the rooms. So we need to find a solution for that room specifically, but I, I think we need to provide alternative solutions moving forward with this round of SPRs because um, it's not fair on, on you as members to, you, to give your time mm. and they're not mm. able to hear what's going on. That's not acceptable. Mm. We need to be working hybridly and, and that's exactly what we should be doing. So if you leave that with me, Councillor Ann, I'll, I, 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 plans are in motion, I think. Okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, Reen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Reen, because I know um, that uh, several of us attended um, a meeting remotely in Quid Petal and the owls just went weren't working and you just couldn't couldn't hear anything it was it was not not good so thank you Councillor Charlie um, yeah just to build on Fran's point I mean we discussed earlier that 70 percent of our funding is external uh, we won't know what we're getting next year until 10th of December um, we really need sort of multi-year settlements so you can actually project what your income will be 
business grants as well and in the shared prosperity fund we got um, 20 million plus four million pounds for the multiply which is over three years but that will run out in march next year we don't know what's going to replace it we don't know what the mechanism will be we don't know what the amounts are so uh, i'm going to meeting after this today i think there's five businesses that will be support well if members support them they, they you know we'll be helping them out but if that money doesn't come to us then we haven't got those funds so if, i think a lot of our stuff is by its very nature aspirational is what we'd like to do but clearly these things cost money and the only part we have control is council tax which unfortunately has had to be hiked up over the last two years just to kind of plug the hole so i think we do need to look at it and we do need to be realistic about what we want and what can we, we can achieve are not necessarily aligned but it's a very valid point thanks Anne. thank you for that councillor charlie um, apologies, Fran, I would normally have asked my questions in the pre-meet, but given everything, uh, we weren't able to have the pre-meet. Um, I'd like to throw a, a question out there to members when we review the corporate plan. Page 151. Do we as an authority really think we can afford net zero by 2030? We've just talked about the crisis in our foster cares, haven't we? Um, and we have to look at our priorities um, and if there's something that can be spread over a longer period. I really think we seriously need to consider that in terms of the finances for this authority and, and prioritising um, things that w w we know we've already talked about um, our most vulnerable, haven't we? And one of my other questions was around, um, it was number, let's have a look, M3.2. I think it's especially important that we measure the progress of our ALN pupils, you know, given the cuts to TAs and things like that. I think that's really, really important that, that we do that. Um, we look at the net zero. And also, I have a question, page 154, M2.8. Assessment how um, events impact on our economy. Um, we haven't got data for that, have we? How can we be sure um, proper sort of evidence is there when, when we make decisions based on, on events. So, so that was a, a question. Right, try to scribble them down. First first day back from annual leave, I thought I was doing well up until now. Oh, it's okay, <laughs> I thought today was Monday, so it's absolutely fine. Oh, there we are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely fine, Fran. I'm Thanks. still six hours ahead. Um, <laughs> in terms of net zero, my understanding is that's a um, legal um, obligation in terms of Welsh government. So I don't think that's within our, our gift, Councillor Cheryl. Um, in terms of the feedback from the nighttime economy, um, that's an area uh, where we struggle with staff cuts. We used to have a member of the team that would go out and do surveys. And obviously we don't have that post anymore. So that's why the commentary for um, ECS rather than, than for people in performance um, is to consider how um, they can develop further measures from their feasibility study, but it, it is an area of area of strain. And I've forgotten the third question. So two out of three wasn't bad. That was um, well. I'd asked about how the oh. events, how we measure events, impact yeah. on the economies. Is that what you were referring to in that? Yeah. Oh, so you ALN. That was more ALN. just a ALN, statement, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Um, so the net zero is non-negotiable. That's a worry, isn't it? Um, Okay, members, have we got have we got any more questions, comments? No. In that case, could I have a proposer and a seconder, please, for recommendations 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3? Councillor Paul, Councillor Hannah. Right, would everyone like to show, please? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our officers today. And that's the meeting closed. Deal.